Mr. Incredible, superhero, superhero, and now his life has been reduced to paper pushing in an insurance company. The life that he had is no longer there. He's, 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 he's not who he's been called to be. He's not living out that life that he's supposed to be. He's no long, his life has no longer meaning or purpose. And I imagine some of us can relate, you know, when we, we look at our lives and the jobs that we have and the work that we do that, that just starts to consume our we, we it consumer, we, we start spending our lives, more of our lives at work than at home. I, I, when I was with UPS uh, for like 28 years, uh, there was weeks. I wouldn't see my kids at all. I'd get off at night, especially at Christmas time. I was an Ebenezer Scrooge. I didn't like Christmas at all. I'd work to 9 o'clock at night and get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and be gone. I never would see my kids during Christmas, so I didn't look forward to it. It just, I missed so much in 28 years of life as being at home. And the, the, when we're at work like this, sometimes the world that we live in, that job that we're doing, it can start to look like a little cubicle. A bunch of cubicles and a lot of separated spaces and people going about doing the same thing they do every day after day after day after day. And, and if we're not careful, careful with it, it begins to affect our view on life itself. We start looking at life this way. We compartmentalize things in life and we start getting depressed and disgusted. We, we begin to dislike our job. We don't even like going to work. When the flu season comes, we're like, yeah, I can get some days off. I don't even have to be sick. I'll just call and say, it's a flu season. I think I got the flu, and I, I just need to get away. You see, this starts to affect the way we live our life because we, we're so overwhelmed by the jobs that we have. So what I want to do today is I want to, as we continue this study in, in 2020, there are, are series loosely based on New Year's resolutions because most of New Year's resolutions are focused on uh, improving our health, and improving our finances, and improving in, in relationships. But I want us to take a turn and look at it a little differently. And our challenge is to not focus on that as much as a personal spiritual growth this year. To focus this year, our life, on growing spiritually in our relationship with God and with other people. And uh, last week we learned that from the letter that Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians. He reminded the believers in that church that this is the life that you had. The life that you used to have was, was you were dead to sin. But the, the life you've been given now, you've been given a brand new life through God's grace. It's a gift. You didn't do this. God did this to his son's death and resurrection. You've been given this brand new life. And, we, and God has saved us. We learned this last week that God saved us to make a difference now. Not somewhere in the future when we have enough or know enough. But now, because we've been given this new life. And after us understanding and realizing that the only reason, the only reason we have this life, this salvation, is because of God's grace to us. So now we want to turn our focus, now we want to turn our focus in our life to this one thing. This one thing that consumes the vast majority of our time in this life. Work. It's not a, not a popular topic to talk about, but work, how much work consumes us. But if we can look within that job that we do, the work that we're doing, and find ways that we can grow in a personal, spiritual way to help us grow to be who God has called us to be where we work this year, to do it this year. Now, like I said, work is not a really a popular topic to talk about in church, but we need to understand that work is important to God. It, he's, he sort of created it. He sort of manufactured it and put it into practice. When, when you open the Bible and you start in Genesis, at creation, you get into Genesis chapter 2. And it says this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man, that's Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. He gave Adam a job to do. And it was overwhelming, so he gave him a help meet, a helper. He gave him Eve to help with the garden, to work in the garden. This was their responsibility. This is what they were expected to do, this to take care of this. And even, even when, when God kicked them out of the garden because of sin and God expelled them from the Garden of Eden, they were still challenged by God to work the ground, do something. You have a... What, what it turns out is this uh, doing a job and working is actually fundamentally part of our identity as a child of God. Not that we're just happy and just jumping through fields of daisies and stuff, but we also have this identity with God that we work. 
We do things. We, we conquer things. We, we accomplish things. We work on this. This is part of our identity. And so we carry, when, we carry this image of God with us every day. Even when we work, we're to carry this image of God with us. And when a child of God chooses not to work, when a child of God says they have no desire to work, when a child of God says, I don't want to do anything, we elect them to Congress. I, don't know, I had to go there. I mean, they, they, they've, been, they've been there for three years and hadn't done a thing. Uh, I mean, but when, when a child of God refuses to work or chooses not to work, then they're failing to do what God expects them to do. It's what he expects us to do. We don't, we, we're failing God. That's why when you read in, in 2 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul could say what he said to the Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. He's ta- he's not, now listen, he's not talking to someone who's physically unable to work. He's not talking to someone who just can't find a job because there are no jobs available. He's speaking to people who choose not to work. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do anything. If they don't want to work as a child of God, you don't have to feed them. Don't let them eat. God expects us to work. He expects us to do something. That's that's what we should do when we go to work. This is is honoring God when we go to work. So so you may be thinking, okay, I got it. I got it, Ronnie. You, You talked about in creation, we're supposed to work, and God created people to work, and it's our job as a child of God, as an image bearer of God, that we should work. I got that. But what's my vocation supposed to be? What am I supposed to be doing? What vocation? The word vocation is a Latin word pronounced vocatio. And the meaning of that word in Latin is calling. Well, what's, what am I supposed to be doing? What's my vocation? What's my calling? What does God want me to do? From a Christian perspective, when we look at work from a Christian perspective, we believe that God calls us. God calls us to do something in this life, to make a difference now. We talked about that last week. God has called us to do that, to make a difference. And it's a work that we work on. So here's what I want us to understand today and take from today. That everyone has a calling. Every one of us has a calling. But that calling might not be their job. It might not be their job. I'm sure you've heard people say, well, I just, I just want to know. I'm trying to find my calling. I'm, I'm trying to find out what, what is God's calling on my life. I'm sure you heard people ask that question. What is God's calling on my life? What is God wanting me to do? And, and then what puzzles me is that before they, take, before they even take time to listen for God to give them an answer for what he's called them to do, they change jobs. They'll change careers. They're, they're, and they'll tell you, well, I'm just trying to find out what my calling is. I'm trying to make a living doing what I love. But the fact of the matter is, that may not be possible. It may not be possible. And I know you come into church this morning, like, that's not very encouraging, Ronnie. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about getting another job. I'm actually applying for a job. And you're thinking it might be impossible for me. See, listen, we, we'll find a job and we may end up in a job that pays really good. Pays us really good money. Pays all our bills. But then eventually that job starts to consume our time. And more and more of our time because we want to make more. And before long, we're working so much, we're taking us away from our family, taking away from home. All of our time is at work, and now we despise what we loved. It gets out of hand. It consumes us. And when it starts consuming us, then our mind starts asking these questions again. Well, what am I called to do? What am I supposed to be doing? What job am I supposed to do? What's my vocation? How, what am I supposed to be doing? What does God want me to do with my life? Then see, this conversation, these questions that we have in our head, this, these questions appear in the Bible. There was a conversation going on between John the Baptist and some Jewish, uh, Jewish crowd that he was talking to beside the Jordan River. This is in Luke chapter 3. If you brought your Bibles with you today, I encourage you to go ahead and find Luke chapter 3 so you can follow along. If you have the app on your phone, I'm going to give you a minute to, to get online and get, go on the Wi-Fi and locate that app and find Luke chapter 3. And while you're doing that, I want to give you a little bit of history of everything that's going on at this moment in Luke. John the Baptist is fulfilling his calling. He's actually doing what he was called to do. From his, before he was even born, we read that John's calling on his life was to prepare the way of the Lord. 
His calling is to prepare the way of the Lord, prepare people for the arrival of Jesus, to one day that they would meet Jesus. And one day here in Luke, he's, he's there beside the Jordan River, and he's having a conversation. Actually, he's preaching very passionately to the people that have gathered around him in the Jordan River. And he's telling them that, that their relationship with Abraham means nothing. If there's no evidence in their life of a relationship with God personally, if all you got is your relative way back there, thousands of years, thousands of years, thousand years ago, if you if all you got is Abraham, that's nothing. God can raise up rocks to be part of Abraham's family. Just, you, just because your grandparents were Christian means nothing. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're not going to get into heaven as a grandchild of God. You're not going to get into heaven as a nephew of God. You have to have a personal relationship with God. And there needs to be evidence, unless there's evidence. And what he's talking about evidence, there needs to be fruit. Because if you're a child of God, there's fruit. There's evidence that people see that you have a relationship with God. You're a child of God. This is what you have to have. He said, he's, getting, he's, getting, he's got their attention. He tells them that this, this a Messiah that's coming, he's going to chop your tree down. He's going to chop that family tree down. Because you're not even really connected. You just think because you're a tree, that blesses you. No, you're not. He's going to chop that down. You need to know, meet him. You need to meet him. He's coming. The Lord is coming soon, so you better get right or you're going to get left. It's basically, he's the little hellfire and brimstone. He's jumping on them, and they're responding. And they're coming forward, and they're wanting to get baptized. He's calling them to repent, and they're repenting. He's saying you need to get baptized, and they're getting baptized. And then when they get baptized, oh, this is another something I learned. Did, did you know there's a difference between the baptism of John the Baptist and our baptisms today? Now, back then, they, they immersed. And they went down to the river, down to the lake, High Rock Lake, and they immersed. We, we, that's all the same. But it, the, the purpose behind it was different. See, when John baptized people back then, they were looking forward to the coming Messiah. When we baptize today, we're looking back at the finished work of the Messiah, that what he did on the cross and how he rose from the grave. John's baptism was a preparation. The baptisms we go through today and do today are a response. There's the difference. And even though they're different in that one little, one little area, the questions that come about after someone gets baptized back then in Luke and today are the same questions, the very same questions. Look in Luke chapter 3, verse 10. The people have come forward, they repented, they're getting baptized, and then they say, what should we do then? The crowd asks, what am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed to do with my life now? That I've got, I've got baptized now, what? What do I do now? John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Sounds like an odd answer. No. No. Baptism symbolizes a changed life. If you have a changed life because of your relationship with God, you should live your life differently. Your life should be a change that people see. You should care for other people and serve other people beyond yourself. You can't be selfish anymore. You have to be selfless. If you've got two shirts and they don't have one, then don't just say you've got two shirts. Give them a shirt. If you've got food and they got none, give them some food. This is evidence of a change. You're doing something different in your life. So people are coming forward, and they're, they're getting baptized. And it, it, he's saying, you need, to, you need to care for other people. You need to glorify God and bring joy to these people. Show God that you're his child and make, bring joy to these people and do this. And so people are coming forward and getting baptized. It's just like a big church revival, a big church. And then just like church, churches today and society today and culture today, they'll see some people in the crowd coming to get baptized, and they say, I don't think they should get baptized. They don't fit in. They're not welcome here. They shouldn't be here. And there were people in that crowd that were coming to get baptized that the rest of the Jews in the crowd, they despised, and they didn't want them there. Verse 12, even tax collectors. See, tax collectors were basically legalized Jewish thieves. They were hired by the Roman government to... Government to Impose taxes on the Jewish people to collect taxes from them. So they would collect tax from you for the Romans. Then they would collect tax from you for the Jews. Then they'd add a little bit on top of it. They'd fudge the numbers a little bit to raise your taxes so they'd take that difference and pocket it themselves on top of being paid by the Roman government. 
I'm so glad the world is different today. Today it's telemarketers. We despise telemarketers. I hope you're not in here, but... You know, we look at our phone and it's possible spam. Tell a marketer, we don't answer. We just don't want to. Do. I don't even answer when I see myself calling me. You ever had those? That they use your number to call you. And I'm like, hey, really? And then I find myself talking to myself. You didn't mess me up. So anyway, tax collectors are coming forward to get baptized. People that are despised. I mean, even when Jesus ate with tax collectors, the, gov- the people around him there in the, the city, they didn't like it. Why is he doing that? We despise those people. They're worse than Samaritans. We don't want anything to do with these tax. But here they come. They're walking forward to get baptized. It says even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they asked the same questions everybody else asked. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? I know what you told them. But what do we do? How do we change our life so that they don't despise us anymore? So that they don't ridicule us anymore. So that they don't persecute us anymore and walk away from us and shun us anymore. Our own relatives. Verse 13. Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Notice what he didn't tell them. He did not tell them to quit their job because now they're a follower. That they're a believer. He doesn't tell them to quit their job but to do their job with honesty and integrity. Do your job in a way that glorifies God and brings joy to the people. They don't like being taxed, so don't tax them any more than they're supposed to be. Don't pocket the difference. And then some soldiers come forward. The tax collectors are despised enough, but now there's soldiers coming. There's actually soldiers that are coming forward. And a lot of people say, well, I think that's Roman soldiers. No, no. See, the commentators, I've read several commentaries, and they said it's very unlikely that a Roman soldier is going to walk up to a Jewish prophet and ask for counsel. It's not going to happen. They're slaves. They're captives. They're not going to listen to them. So it's not Roman soldiers. These are pretty much temple guards. They've actually been sent out by the church. The temple that was being ruled by Herod and Agrippa, ripping off people, harassing fellow Jews, persecuting them when they're false witness, under false pretenses, just being ugly, basically. And now they're coming forward to get baptized, and they want to know what they're supposed to do now. What are we supposed to do? They ask him, what, what should we do? I mean, how do we change? How does our life change so they don't hate us? We're just doing our job. He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Don't use your authority. Don't use your position for personal gain. Be content with your pay. Don't grumble about how much you just got paid. You were being paid and said, well, I'll just, I'll just make these people pay me some more. And I'll make those people pay me some more. I'll take them to jail. I'll accuse them. Of something. He said, no, don't do that. Don't quit your job. But just do it with honesty and integrity. Glorify God and bring joy to others see now you have Luke chapter 3 and I got it and we can read it together and we can look at it and read it over and over and over we can see John's answer to all three groups of people that have asked him the question we can read those answers but did you know there's a there's a an unspoken answer there's an implied answer that we need to look in these in these verses and see that's very important for us to hear today just but see just because someone was a tax collector just because they were a soldier doesn't mean that that was their calling. That was their job, but it mean, doesn't mean that that was their calling. Just because you work in sales or in construction or at Walmart or food line or for the government, local city government, county government, state government, whatever you do, whatever kind of job you have, that job may not be your calling but it doesn't mean you should go quit that job. Don't don't walk walk into your job tomorrow and say, my pastor said I should quit. No, I did not. I didn't, and John didn't. Don't quit your job because the job, even when people, all right, today, if you choose Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today and your life has changed today, when you go to work tomorrow, you're going back to the same job. The job remains the same. But God's calling on us 
changes how we do the job. Understand? God's calling. This is what it's, your calling may not be your job, but when you're at your job, you are called by God to live out your faith. To live out a faith that glorifies God and brings joy to others. It glorifies God and brings joy. That's, joy. that's everyone's calling. Not just a select few. Oh, well, you're the pastor. That's your calling. No. This is everybody's calling. Every single, our, our jobs may be different. We may have different vocations, different jobs that we do. But we all have the same calling. It's to glorify God and bring joy to others. I mean, that's, when you look at it, that's what John the Baptist told the tax collectors. Don't charge any more than you're supposed to. Just do your job with honesty and integrity. Soldiers, don't mistreat people. Don't accuse anybody falsely. Just do your job the way you're supposed to. Glorify God. Bring joy to others. Our, our, calling, our calling is to make our, our work an extension of our faith in and our worship of God. It's to be an extension, not a separation. So what happens here in church on Sunday carries over during the week on our job. Because if we say we're a person of faith, if I, if I say I'm a person of faith, that means to, if I tell that to somebody, that means I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. If I say that to someone that I'm a person of faith, that means I'm a child of God. And if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and a child of God, then we, need to be, we should be consistent in that, in that faith. It can't be just a one-hour faith. It has to be a 24-7 faith our entire life. We, we should be the same person we've been called by God to be. Whether we're at work, whether we're at church, at home with our family, out in public, or hiding on Facebook. The reason I say hiding on Facebook is I think that's what people do. They hide who they are on Facebook. Let me, let me explain why I say that. Sometimes I read stuff on Facebook from people that I know. And what I read makes me think I don't know them at all. Does that make sense? I mean, they're one person one day, and they're one person in, they're one person in front of me face to face, but then I read some stuff they put on Facebook, and I, who are they? Is that the same person that I just talked to yesterday? And I'm not even going to get into Instagram. I'm not even going to mess with that one. See, people should recognize God in us and God through us all the time. Whether we're on a Sunday morning or at our job, they should recognize God inside of us. When I was thinking about uh, growing at work and answering my calling at work or encouraging people to live their calling at work. I was doing some studying this week, and especially there in Genesis, and we read about it earlier in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, where God placed Adam in the garden to work it and take care of it. And I was reading the commentary about it, and there's a Hebrew word for the work. The Hebrew word in Genesis for work is abad. Can y'all say that with me on three? One, two, three. Abad. That's in the Hebrew, that means work. But it's the same word. This is the same word they use to describe the work of the priest in the temple when they were leading people in worshiping God. Abad, work, is the same word as worship. That our job, what we do, where we work, can be worship. You're crazy, Ronnie. <laughs> no, no. You, it can be worship if you look at it right. If you look through the right lens of what you're doing. See, most times we see our job through the lens of this world. Society and culture, the way we were raised and the way everybody else lived. We clock in. We clock out. We get paid. And we repeat. We clock in. We clock out. We get paid. We repeat. It, that's just the way we see our job. I got to go in Monday. I work Monday through Friday. Click, click, these so hours. I got so many hours. I don't want overtime. Uncle Sam gets a big portion of that. I did so many hours. Clock out. Get me out of here. And we just, we just go through the motion. But that's, well, that's looking through the world's lens. But when we look through the right lens, the lens that God has really given us, the lens that God has called us to, we see things differently. We see our job differently. 
Kind of like what Paul says to the Colossians in chapter 3, verse 23. He wrote, whatever you do, whatever your job is, wherever you're working, whatever you're doing, whatever your job is, work at it with all your heart. Be all in. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do your job with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Be all in. Don't hold back. Don't cut corners. Don't check out early. Don't come in late. Just be all in. When all, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working, abide for the Lord. As if you're worshiping God, bringing glory to God. Whatever you do, bring glory to God. Not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. It's so on your job, whatever you do, glorify God and bring joy to others. That's your calling. I don't care what you do. I don't care what your job is. It doesn't matter what your job is. You could be under the pressures of a large corporation trying to govern that and lead that. You could just be driving a truck. You could be just digging a ditch. You could be moving pallets. You could be stocking shelves, doing technology. You, you could stay at home and raise children. And take, it doesn't matter what your job is. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to worship God in whatever I'm doing, no matter what's going on. And when we look at our job through that lens, we won't ever be in a cubicle. We won't ever be going through the same old, same old, same old day after day. We'll be living a life of faith. A faith of glorifying God, bringing joy to others. Worshiping God in our job, being who God has called us to be, making a difference now, not only for ourselves, not making our life better for ourselves, but those that we work with, our family, the people that we serve with at church. It, 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 all, it all starts to spill over. and come to, when, we, when we live out our calling to bring glory to God and joy to others, no matter where we work, we're being an image bearer of God. People will see the image of God in us in how we do our job. How we work at it. How we respond to our job. They'll see the, do they see the image of God in us all the time? And I learned this, that as we worship God on our job, no matter what we're dealing with, as we worship God on our job, He'll open our eyes. And such, He'll open our eyes to see past the time clock. He'll open our eyes to see past the deadlines. He'll open our eyes to see past the mundane and begin to recognize others. We'll see the, we will see the depression in others. We'll see the, the struggles in other people. We'll recognize their hurts more clearly. And as we're worshiping God and being an image of God, a child of God at work, we'll reach out to them because we're called to serve other people. And love our neighbors as ourselves. And we'll reach out to them. And you just never know that all they might need is just a glimpse of a God that loves them through our actions. Or through our compassion. And just through our sitting and talking with them. That they'll get to meet a God who loves them so much that his son died for them. Because we were worshiping God at work. See, because God loves us, because Jesus sacrificed himself for us, we've all been given a new life with a specific calling to glorify God and bring joy to others. Everybody has that calling. It's not a, you don't have to have a special gift from God to glorify him and bring joy. You don't have to have a special talent to glorify God and bring a gift, uh, joy to others. It's, it's, we're all given that. We all have this ability. We just need to have a clear understanding of who God is and what he did for us. So my prayer for all of us this year, 2020, is to, to live our lives with fruit of our calling that people will see God in us. Let's pray. God, your word challenges us, it encourages us, it convicts us. But it teaches us so much when we look at it, when we look closer at what's going on at the time, and we can apply it to our lives today. There's so many struggles we know that people go through. Then we go through struggles ourselves. We, we don't really like the job we're going to go to tomorrow. But maybe it's not the job. Maybe it's how we see the job. Do we see it as an opportunity to worship you? To let people know about your son's 
death on the cross and his resurrection? Do we let, do, do, do an oppor- is it an opportunity for us to show the love of God by caring for someone else? That you placed us in their lives for a specific reason. That's our calling. We're, on earth, we're here on earth to make a difference, to make a difference now. And that can be on our job. I want you to think about this while you're praying. <clears throat> There's people that you work with. There's people that you're around. There's people in your family. that you know just by observing how they do their job, how they respond to their work, that they're struggling with a relationship with God. They don't have the same relationship you have with God. You can see it. And if you can see that, you know they can see you that way. Do they see you as a child of God? Let me tell you what it really looks like when someone sees you as a child of God. In this dark world, in this evil world, and all that's happening, they look at you, a child of God, worshiping God at work, glorifying God, and bringing joy to others, caring for others. They look at you in a world of defeat, in a world of anger, and they see victory. You're not who you were. You're living out who God has called you to be. And they see that. Why is it we don't always take advantage of that? And let them get to know the person who has seen a victory in their life. That their sin has been taken away. Their mistakes have been forgiven. They've been given a new life. From the darkness to light. From loss to saved. From despair to victory. This year, 2020, our challenge is to let people see God in me and let them experience a victory of God's love and grace and mercy in their life. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your son's death and resurrection. We thank you for your grace. And may you continue, continue to love us and use us on our jobs to make a difference. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.